Good evening. Hello. How is everybody doing? Hi. I have the distinct disadvantage of pulling you away from wonderful food, but bear with me. Thank you so much. Welcome. I want to add my welcome. My name is Kathy Hessler, and I have the privilege of teaching at Lewis and Clark. Yay, Lewis and Clark. <laughs> <laughs> and I had the privilege of serving on the planning committee with um, folks you met last night and a couple people you didn't meet, so I'd like to give them a shout out. So we have Elena Gavonis. Wave, Elena. Thank you. A really important member of our team. Thank you. And you've, you've, many of you have probably met her at the registration table. And we also had, many of you saw Megan Amos last night but didn't realize that she was our student representative, she was representing SOLDIF for the planning committee, and so where's Megan? There's Megan. Thank you, Megan. I'd also like to give a quick round of applause um, to our servers, our staff, the Hilton folks have been great. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you've done to make this a great conference. So it's a privilege for me to be here, as I've said. Um, we know that many folks are struggling around the world right now, dealing with floods, fires, other hardships, people who aren't able to make it, people we know and people we don't know. So our hearts go out to them, our thoughts go with them, and it makes us realize how really lucky we are to be here with one another. And I have to say I'm so pleased to see the energy that people are putting into using this privilege well using it to make the lives of animals better, using it to empower yourself so that you can do good work. So thank you for all of that. Um, a quick administrative note, we'll be back here tomorrow. Tomorrow the ballroom will be split. There'll be ballroom one, ballroom two, but it's basically the same space, so you know to come back here tomorrow. Um, okay, so I get to introduce a really quick video. We. Um, invited Congressman Earl Blumenauer, some of you may know him, and he wasn't able to be with us, but he took the time to film a video um, to, to share his greetings with us. For those of you who don't know him, he's a dear friend of Lewis and Clark. He's a double alum of the college and the law school. He's been in Congress since 1996. He's spent his entire life in public service, and he's the co-chair with his Republican colleague, of the Bipartisan Animal Law Caucus, doing amazing work on behalf of animals at the federal level. Um, he's done wonderful things for, he, he usually wears a bike pin. I tried to find mine, but I've given mine all the way to students. Um, he wears a bike pin everywhere he goes, and he talks about bike partisanship, as a way, which is awesome. And it works really well here and elsewhere. So um, I think, are we ready for the video? Good evening. I'm Congressman Earl Blumenauer. I'm disappointed that I'm not there with you all tonight. Ironically, I'm in Los Angeles getting an award for my leadership on animal welfare with my friend Wayne Pacelli, the head of the Humane Society of the United States. The Animal Law Conference this year is a milestone for several reasons. First, it's the 25th anniversary. I extend my congratulations and admiration to the organizers, the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark, the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and Lewis and Clark Student Animal Legal Defense Fund for staging year after year this premier gathering of thought and practice leaders. A quarter century of bringing together animal advocates, a hallmark of the movement for animal welfare. It's yet another example of how you've been a catalyst as prestigious academic institutions are now assuming their role helping you lead the way with animal law studies and advocacy. You should know that advocacy is more critical now than ever. As co-chair of the Congressional Animal Protection Caucus, I work to bring members of Congress together to support animal welfare issues, which are nonpartisan and widely accepted. While real progress has been made, as I documented in my recent article in the Animal Law Review, that progress has not matched either the need or that broad public support. And we always need strong advocates like you to help keep pushing society to do and be better for our fellow creatures. 
This cause has never been more challenging than now in the time of Trump. I commend you for your work here, the 25th year. Thank you for your efforts, and I wish you luck as we work together to make animal welfare a priority for everyone and make progress on all fronts. We're sorry he couldn't be with us, but we're grateful for the work he does. So if anyone wants to send a shout out to his office and thank him, just let him, we'll, we'll send him your applause um, and your thanks. So now, what folks are probably all really here for is to hear from our next speaker. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Jonathan Balcom. Many of you know his work. I have brought um, my edition of his book that a student sent to me all the way from England. So I have the English edition. I was going to wave it around and say, if you don't already have this book, you might really want to get it. Um, but you can't get this one. <laughs> you can get the same book, just different cover. Um, I'm privileged to introduce him because the work he does makes my work easier. He's able to share with people issues in a really um, understandable way, um, open their eyes to issues that really helps me then talk about, now that you understand there are issues out there, I can talk to you about the legal things that we need to do to help these animals that you may not have thought about before. Dr. Balcom is a biologist, an author, and a lifelong animal advocate. He has a PhD in ethology from the University of Tennessee where he studied communication in bats. He has published over 50 journal articles and book chapters ranging from turtle nesting behavior, <clears throat> excuse me, to the ethics of animal dissection. His 2006 book, Pleasurable Kingdom, is the first in-depth examination of animals' capacity to enjoy life. His subsequent books, um, <laughs> excuse me, Second Nature and The Exultant Ark, also present animals in a new light and presage a revolution in the human-animal relationship. His latest book, the New York Times bestseller, What a Fish Knows, explores the private lives of the planet's most misunderstood and maligned vertebrates. Jonathan is a director of animal sentience with the Humane Society Institute for Science and Policy based in Washington, DC. He's also the founding editor of Animal Sentience, another source, if you don't know about it, I would highly recommend, it's wonderful. The first scholarly journal of animal feeling. A popular commentator, he has appeared on Fresh Air with Terry Gross, on the BBC, the National Geographic Channel, and several documentaries. He's contributed features and opinions to the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Nature, and other pu publications. So it's my great honor and privilege to welcome Dr. Balcom. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Can everybody hear me OK? Great. Uh, it's an incredible honor and pleasure to be here to give a keynote address to this austere, August austere. Maybe that's not the right word. There's another word like that. Maybe it's August uh, audience. Anyway, it's just amazing to be amongst all this energy, this intellectual power in the interest of animals. And if there's any domain that needs it, it's the law, the legal area. So um, I'm really delighted to be part of this. We generally view fishes in one of two contexts, as a source of food or a so source of recreation. My uh, career at fishing was very brief in childhood. When it came time to bait my own hooks with wriggling earthworms and pull them out of fish's faces, I soon lost any enthusiasm I previously had. I just couldn't help seeing it from the fish's perspective. And um, back in those days, early 70s, um, I, I, we made regular family trips to McDonald's, and I always had the filet of fish um, but I never associated the fishes on the end of the hook with the, um, the, the anonymous fishes who ended up in these pieces of food that I had. Note the uh, absence of kale and spinach and other nice green leafies there. In those days, McDonald's was boasting one billion customers served, one billion served, and uh, they were, of course, referring to customers, but they could just as soon have been referring to chickens or fishes, for that matter. And I remember seeing the stacks of tuna cans on the supermarket shelves and thinking how um, th these are just insignificant little things. I never really related to what a, con what a tuna was. I had no idea that a tuna is, in fact, a huge apex predator that can grow to twice the size of a tiger, can swim faster than a tiger can run, and um, is an apex predator. 
and not to demean tigers, um, they also can live twice as long. And you may recall these crests, these campaigns, uh, I always find it, found it when I started thinking about it, ironic that we had dolphin safe tuna campaigns. I, I never heard about a tuna safe tuna campaign. So tonight I want to invite you to see fishes through a different lens. I've spent uh, the last four and a half or so years researching, swimming among, researching and writing about fishes, culminating in this book. Here's the American edition, which there's plenty of copies here tonight. And uh, I just want to share with you some of the highlights of that. There's way more in the book than I can cover in my four and a half hour lecture tonight. <laughs> but uh, I thought I'd start out, why are you laughing? I thought I'd start out with some superlatives, and I, I love some of the fish names. If I could share all, all of my favorites with you, it would take four and a half hours, but I'll just share a few of my, of my favorites. Uh, the, clearly the longest fish name known is the Hawaiian reef triggerfish known to the locals as the humu humu nuku nuku apua'a, which is uh, Hawaiian for the fish who sews with a needle and grunts like a pig. My nomination for the most preposterous fish name is the sarcastic fringe head. <laughs> My nomination for the most touching and appropriate fish name is the diagonal banded sweet lips. <laughs> I kid you not, there's a bunch of different sweet lips, but when I see, whenever I see a picture of one, I do want to just swim over to them and give them a big kiss on the lips. I mean, <laughs> those are the most kissable lips in nature, right? You have to agree. Uh, dare I say it, the, I think it's pretty much an adult audience, so I can probably get away with the inadvertently rudest fish name. This is a common species of the Atlantic coastline. Uh, the Latin name is by, uh, Halicaris bivitatus. Common name is Slippery Dick. <laughs> For the least flattering name, I would nominate the hairy-jawed sackmouth. <laughs> Good one to have handy if you want to insult somebody. Now this is one of the deep sea angler fishes and this leads to the next superlative I want to mention which would be perhaps the most bizarre mating system, sexual reproductive system among, certainly among vertebrates. I think the some of the invertebrates would give a stiff challenge to this but among vertebrates this has got to be one of the most bizarre. The deep sea angler fishes of which there are about 160 known species, there are probably a number that have yet to be described by humans. These animals live in the largest livable habitat on Earth, the deep ocean where the light never penetrates. So it's permanently dark, except for the fact that they have a symbiotic relationship with light-emitting bacteria, which are strategically located in their bodies so that they can light them on and off, uh, flash them in different patterns, kind of like fireflies do, and communicate with each other. It's one of the ways that they recognize each other to the species level. And these are females, and males are much, much smaller. They have good vision and a very good sense of smell. They have the proportionally largest nostrils of any fish, and that's probably so that they can sniff out the right species, uh, a female in particular. And because you, they live in this huge, vast habitat where it's very hard to find a mate, when they find a mate, they want to make the most of it. And that means they do something quite strange when they find the right species they bite her, they latch on, and it's the last bite they will ever take. They gradually fuse into her flesh and become part of her body. They, in time, they share her bloodstream. They can even, in time, in, in, um, inseminate her intravenously. Now, scientists call this by, um, sexual parasitism. Uh, I think that, that term is a bit limited because it implies that it's an unwelcome thing for the female to have this, uh, this layabout male, you know, he doesn't, doesn't get the food, he does, doesn't do the dishes, doesn't even take the garbage out. He just hangs on there and you can actually see in this illustration two males attached to the belly of this, this female. But I think sexual parasitism isn't really quite the right term considering that a female's reproductive life history is a dead end unless at least one male finds and latches onto her. And you can see here's that actual photograph. It's very rare that these animals are caught and photographed, which is probably they're happy about that. But, uh, <laughs> but for any uh, radical feminists in the audience, and after one of the sessions today, there might be a few, um, you, might, you might take some grim pleasure in the knowledge that some males only ever do amount to an appendage. <laughs> uh, 
Another fish superlative is perhaps the smallest vertebrate, which goes to this tiny fish of some lakes around the Philippines, of which you could put 300 adults on one side of a scale and an American penny on the other side, and the penny would go down to that tiny. This is not in my book because this came to light after the book was published, but we now have a new record holder for the oldest vertebrate, the longest lived, the longevity record for vertebrates, goes now to the, uh, ice, uh, the Greenland shark. Uh, sadly, this study involved the, uh, looking at the eyes of about 23 individuals who were caught by fishermen. And the scientists doing the study asked for the eyes because you can, there's a technique where you can measure corneal layers, which are laid down year upon year, kind of like you can measure the rings of a tree. And one of the females in the study had 392 corneal layers. So she was approaching her fifth century of life. She was almost 400 years old. At the time, she was caught in a fishing net, presumably healthy. So probably there are some uh, individuals out there who were swimming around before, before Benjamin Franklin flew that kite and got the electric shock. So remarkably long-lived animals. All right, what about fish minds? How do they think? I can only give you a few tidbits here, but I'll, I'll give you a few. Uh, this is the archer fish, so named for its brilliance at squirting water in a powerful jet accurately to catch insects. They may be perched on a leaf or they could be flying by. They use different methods. If the insect's flying by at a certain distance, they will use the quarterback type method where they, where they shoot water predictively. So hopefully the water will arrive where the insect is when the insect gets there, assuming it doesn't deviate from its flight path. If it's closer to the surface of the water, they will rotate their bodies and squirt directly at the insect. They also learn this by apprenticeship. They learn this, but they can learn it by watching others do it, which is considered perspective taking, which is widely regarded as a pretty high-level cognitive feat by any creature. There's a lot else I could say about them, but time doesn't permit me. You can watch some nice YouTube videos of this behavior. We have documentation of tool use by fishes. This is a, a spotted uh, tusk fish who has blown water, used water as a tool to uncover a clam underneath the sand, and then picked up the clam in the mouth and carried the clam to a nearby piece of coral or rock and with a series of well-timed, well-coordinated head flicks and releases is able to smash open this unfortunate mollusk to eat. Note a number of fishes, by, bystanders or by swimmers if you like, swimming nearby, opportunistically hoping for an opportunity to get some food for themselves. These animals are alert and aware and opportunistic. Excuse me. Yes. Is it a little hard to hear? <laughs> I'm one of you. Uh, how's that? Okay, I'll try and speak a little louder. Do wave your arm if you can't hear me, okay? And I just realized I forgot to turn my stopwatch on, so I'm going to be relying on the uh, timekeepers when it gets to the... Where's my timekeeper? There you are. We've got at least 10 minutes left. No, I'm just teasing. Um, I love the fact that fishes, fall, those ones who've been tested, fall for the same optical illusions that we do. This is the Ebbinghaus illusion in which the two orange dots are the same size, but because of the arrangement of blue circles around them, the one on the right in this case looks larger. And you can train fishes to uh, push their nose against the larger of two circles and then you, and you reward them for that. And then you present them with this illusion and they will go to the one on the right and push that. Um, they believe, it, it says something poignant about them. They, they can believe something that's actually not true, that they're fallible. I mean, there's a lot of deception in nature and deception plays on the fallibility of one's judgment. So, and uh, individuals like um, this bamboo shark here will perceive a, a, a triangle in this so-called Kinesa triangle. There's actually no triangle in the figure. It just looks like there's one. So they're visually perceiving the, their environments in ways that we can relate to. You may have heard that fishes have lousy memories, the three sec famous, infamous three-second goldfish memory. It's complete nonsense. Um, this is a little a memory champion among fishes called the frillfin goby, and a series of captive experiments done in New York City, of all places, during the 70s and earlier, found this animal makes mental maps. This is their habitat. They live in the tide pool zone. And people had noticed that they can jump accurately from one tide pool to another if an octopus comes in who's hungry or some other reason they want to get out of there. They can do this. And the question is, how do they know which way to jump and how far to jump? 
And uh, they, what they do is they swim over this area at high tide when the water's over. They swim down among the nooks and crannies and in one day they can memorize the topography of this tide pool zone and then they can uh, translate that to a horizontal view, if you like, uh, when the tide is out. So it's a pretty amazing piece of what we call mental mapping. And they can remember that tide pool zone 40, 40 days later without any, any, any experience with it in the meantime. Aquarium fish keepers have often claimed that they recognize us as individuals. It's like, yeah, my little fish knows when I'm going to feed him or her. And indeed, a, a research team from Germany has now actually shown this, demonstrated this with a series of studies using the archer fish. In the right part of the picture, you can see the little archer fish in a tank with a display of two faces on a screen above. The beautiful thing about archer fish is they can tell you which one they recognize by squirting water at it. So it's a very unambiguous indication of what they see. And as the left figure shows, you can remove the hair from the face pictures, uh, even the ears, and they still can recognize a familiar face among 40, uh, at least 40, unfamiliar faces. So they have excellent powers of recognition. Of course, I need to add that I'm generalizing here. What applies to an archer fish may not apply to another species. And there's over 33,000 species of, of fish, fishes in the world. Uh, but nevertheless, these are feats that are clearly cognitive in nature and go, go far beyond what we thought fishes could do. Fishes, in, according to a very recent study published just about three weeks ago, are also subject to the face inversion effect. This is an effect we have as well. We don't recognize faces, a familiar face if it's upside down very well at all. A different part of the brain processes that and doesn't do very well at it. Same for fishes. Um, in contrast, chimpanzees are very good at recognizing upside down faces, and if you think about their biology, there's good reasons for that. A little bit about fish psychology, the fact that they have emotions. Here's an amazing study. There's a, there's a picture that's missing from my presentation, but I'll, I'll describe it as best I can. It was a study of, I think it was 32 striated surgeon fishes were, were caught from the Great Barrier Reef where they live. And then they were further stressed. I mean, being caught is pretty stressful. And then they were further stressed by being put into um, a shallow bucket of water for 30 minutes. And you can measure stress in a fish by taking a little blood sample and measuring cortisol levels. It's a stress hormone. We have it as well. And then they gave them the opportunity in some of the fish to, to ease their stress by getting a massage, by getting stroked by a painted, accurately painted, realistic model of a cleaner fish. I'm going to get to cleaner fishes a little later, but one of the things they do for their client fishes on the reef is to give them, give them uh, caresses with their fins. And if these stressed surgeon fishes could swim up next to a cleaner fish and get a little massage on their body, they would do that and their stress levels would come down. Surgeon fishes who were stressed, who were put in a tank with a cleaner fish model that was stationary and didn't move back and forth, they ignored it and they didn't get any stress relief. So. Just like for us, a massage is stress relieving for a fish, and they have the wherewithal to relieve that stress. A recent study from Norway, where there's a lot of aquaculture, we've already heard about aquaculture today, looked at a phenomenon that's widespread in aquaculture, so-called dropout fish. And the one on the bottom here is the same age as the one above, these salmon farmed fish. Um, but the one on the bottom has failed to thrive and only weighs about one-third the one above. And this is where they get to when they die. They, they simply stop feeding, they give up, and they float to the surface, and that's it for them. And you can measure cortisol levels in their body, and it's through the roof. It's very, very high. These animals are simply not able to cope with the stresses and strains of crowded environments, very highly competitive environments, um, the pesticides that they may be treated with because of um, high levels of sea lice and other parasites. It's a very difficult existence and the conclusion in this peer-reviewed scientific article was that these dropouts are severely depressed. We can look at anecdotes and relationships that individuals have fishes. This is uh, Mango. He's a nine-year-old Fahaka pufferfish. That's the one on the left. And um, <laughs> when his uh, Human companion comes home from work, Mango, who lives alone because these little creatures are predatory. They don't usually get on too well with tank mates, um, which is another problem with keeping them in captivity. Uh, Mango has these, she called them staring contests. I think it's more like a love fest to me. It looks like Mango's very happy to see her and it's probably being a little unstimulated, although it looks like a quite nice habitat. 
And um, you get the sense after a while that these individuals have personalities. And indeed, there was a recent study showing that indeed fishes do have personalities. And it was actually a study of that tiny little fish in the bottom left, the guppies, which are very popular, um, very popular aquarium fishes, beautiful fancy tails that the males have to try and attract females. A little about communication and a phenomenon that really is quite remarkable between two predatory species of fishes, typically on reefs, groupers and moray eels. And I want to just describe this briefly to you. So we see a grouper on the right, and there's many different species that do this, and a moray eel on the left. You may, may note that's a laminated moray eel. I'll explain that in a moment. But the phenomenon is, and you can watch YouTube videos of this as well, my favorite internet channel, as you can probably tell, YouTube. Um, groupers will recruit moray eels to go hunting with them. They recruit them by swimming up to the moray eel and doing a head shake or even a full body shimmy. And essentially it translates to, will you come foraging with me? And if the moray is hungry and in the mood, off they swim together. They look like characters out of a Disney film, and I kid you not. And the way it works is their hunting styles are complementary. Moray eels are like ferrets of the sea. They can get into those nooks and crannies and chase a fish in there. The, the grouper can't get there. And if the moray eel happens to be successful, great for the moray eel. The moray eel eats the fish. But if that fish escapes the moray eel into open water, you know who's waiting outside. Groupers will also point to a fish who's gone in the reef when there's a moray nearby, essentially telling them, hey, there's someone here. They'll do that for 20 minutes or more. They even may go over and retrieve the moray and bring them back. And the laminated eel is from a study done, captive studies at Cambridge University, where they showed that groupers very quickly learn to recognize and distinguish a cooperative, good collaborator from a bad collaborator. And they'll ignore the bad collaborator who would keep going back into their, into their, into their cave in the reef instead of coming out to help. Um, a, a brilliant science writer from Britain and blogger named Ed Young summed it all up with a familiar jingle. If your prey's in a hole and you don't have a pole, fetch a more. <laughs> can fishes be artists? Yes, they can. There's a little puffer fish previously undescribed by science until this was discovered a few years ago, the males of which spend not hours but days building and maintaining these six foot wide crop circle like mandala like structures on the bottom of the ocean. This was photographed about 80 feet down. There's a beautiful now BBC clip of this you can see on my favorite internet channel. And uh, it's narrated by David Attenborough. It doesn't get better than that. So this little male works diligently for all this time to build this structure. And you know, of course, cynical minded that you are why he's doing it. He's trying to attract a female. And if he does a good enough job, the female will come. They will mate and lay eggs in this beautiful structure, which if he doesn't maintain it, the currents will blow away very soon. And they lay their eggs in the middle, well, she lays her eggs in the middle, and they put little bits of gravel and they break up shells and put them on the, on the top, I guess, to cover them up. I, I don't know if it really, it doesn't look like a very good strategy to me. It looks like a big stamp in the bottom, you know, egg predators, come and get your breakfast right here. And this, here's the spot. But obviously it works because it's evolved and it's a classic example of a sexually selected trait where generations of selective, choosy, artistically discriminating females have led to this um, great investment of effort to build art by males. It's essentially a fish equivalent of the peacock's tail or the tuxedo maybe. <laughs> can a fish be virtuous? Yes, they can be virtuous. A couple of examples here. These are rabbit fishes. This is uh, four different species in each quadrant of the photo. And you can see in each quadrant, there's a pair of them, one of whom is face down doing what rabbit fishes do to eat, which is plucking algae off the coral reef. While there's another one face up playing lookout, foregoing the reward of food, at least for the time being, and delaying gratification to help protect the partner by watching out for predators. It's a pretty vulnerable way to be with your head in the reef. You can't see that moray eel coming along with the grouper. Whereas if you have a lookout who can signal danger coming, you're much safer. And of course, after a couple of minutes, they switch off and the lookout goes down when the other one comes up. So this way they both get to feed much more safely than if they foraged alone. And it's virtuous behavior, because I say it's delayed gratification. There's also virtue and cheating and some pretty Machiavellian dynamics that happen on reefs with the so-called 
probably the, 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 one of the best described and certainly one of the most complex, if not the most complex examples of a mutualism in nature. This is the cleaner client symbiosis. Hands up if you've heard of the cleaner client symbiosis. Okay, quite a few of you. Good, you're very knowledgeable. The way it works is so-called client fishes, they don't call themselves that, we call them, well, maybe they do actually, wouldn't surprise me, but they line up on reefs to wait their turn to be serviced by cleaner fishes. Here you see a pair of them swimming in and out of the mouth, the open mouth of this puffer fish, in and out of the gills where parasites may latch on. So the cleaners pluck off parasites, remove sloughing skin, and generally do a spa treatment to the client fish who gets a parasite removal service. So it's food for uh, parasite removal and spa treatment. And as I said earlier, cleaner fishes will take breaks from plucking parasites and they will just flutter their pectoral fins against the client, presumably to curry favor, to show the client how good we, a service we do, because these guys make their living this way. They don't get fed unless they get clients. And so they want to please their clients, but it does get Machiavellian. If there are not many clients in the queue, it's been shown that they are more prone to doing a shoddy job. They don't, they don't pluck as many parasites. They may even do what's called mucus nipping, where they take a little moat of that slippery layer on the outside of the client fish. And uh, it tastes good to them, apparently, and it's very nutritional. Obviously, clients don't like that, and they will typically jolt. They will do a body jolt, probably because it hurts a bit, but maybe also to signal, A, to the cleaners, I'm on to you, you just violated your, the code of conduct, or, and or, to other clients in the queue, you might want to go somewhere else. These guys aren't doing a good job today. So the studies show that cleaners are more likely to mucus nip when there's no clients in the queue, and they do a much better job, including more of those massages, um, to mollify the clients when there's a lot of cli other clients around, perhaps, who may be impressed with this service. So it really is a complicated thing. There's probably more than 150 published scientific papers on this mutualism. I'm only scratching the surface here, but see, these are some of the more intriguing aspects of it. And I'm sure there'll be many revolutions yet to come in this behavior. And it's probably because fishes clearly like getting touched, at least in the right context, that you have fishes like these adult Nassau groupers who will swim up to scuba divers to receive petting. Trusted divers, probably, probably in areas where there's no spear fishing. Studies show that fishes are much shyer in areas where they're pe per persecuted and they get these strokes. There's no parasite removal service here going on, needless to say. I spoke at a vet school in Kansas last year, and one of the students said, oh yeah, my dad and I meet this NASA grouper every year. I'll send you some pics. So she sent me some photos. She's, here, she's rubbing the chin of this NASA grouper, beautiful long-lived fishes. And here she is mugging for the camera. And uh, here her father is holding his regulator uh, on the open gills of this, this fish, and the bubbles are tickling over the gills where it's very sensitive, probably feels very nice. So that's kind of a summary of some of the things that fishes do. There's so much more. I wrote this book because I became aware of all this amazing science that so little of it was trickling into the human consciousness. So um, it's my hope that this book and these kind of talks will help to alleviate that kind of um, unawareness that we've had. So I want to kind of change tack for the, the last three hours that I have left and talk a little bit about the troubled relationship this is the more sobering part of the talk, but I promise you I will end on a more salubrious note. Um, we, we have had a very, and continue to have an extremely troubled and exploitative relationship with fishes. And I think one of the reasons for this is that we just fail to connect with them and we've been alienated from them. We look at their habitat, we look out over the water and there may be thousands within inches of that surface of that water, but we don't see them. We, we, and it was only in the last half a century or so that we've had the technology to view them at their level, to have the scuba equipment where we can dive and spend time with them and to film them and to put those films on YouTube. And so, um, you know, with the unblinking eyes, which don't need to blink because they're constantly bathed in water, the fact that they make a lot of sounds, there's many different sounds that many species of fishes make, but they're made in a different underwater sound. We don't, we don't recognize, we don't hear them, literally, until we put hydrophones underwater. It's a bit like us shouting or screaming underwater. We don't hear much, much of what goes on there. Um, they're just not evolved to be heard by us, and we really have been uh, missing their signals. 
and we do catch huge numbers of them and the way we've treated the oceans is just a really a might makes right approach. We take as much as our technology will allow us to. And uh, you may have heard this head sobering headline from a study published in 2015. And if you know anything about the history of commercial fishing, you'll know that we'd already lost a lot of marine life before 1970. We have things like climate change, ocean acidification, coral bleaching, Ocean plastics, of which the World Animal Protection estimates we leave or lose about 640,000 tons of fishing gear in oceans. Some of it washes up on beaches every year. I live in South Florida. I pick up at least 100 pieces of plastic when I go to the beach. It's just something I like to do, and it all helps, and other people do this as well, and uh, just in a bag, and I fill that bag within a few minutes. So there's just a lot of ocean plastic out there floating around and washing up on the beaches. And there's another insidious plastic problem, and that is the production of plastic leads to, uh, produces a lot of these tiny little beads, microbeads, which everything pretty much flows downstream. Bad luck for the fishes. And uh, they ends up in the water, and it looks just like fish eggs, which is food for a lot of young fishes. And so fishes like this little baby pike, pike here, they get overwhelmed by this accumulation of undigestible plastic, which ruptures their stomachs and, of course, kills them. And there's estimated to be several quintillion microbeads in the Caspian Sea alone. Of course, the biggest way we harm fishes is directly by catching them. We measure them in hundreds of millions of tons. We don't measure them by individuals. There's been some estimates to calculate how many we take, anywhere from 200 billion to perhaps one to two trillion. So the numbers are inestimable, and it's so easy to forget that everyone, as somebody mentioned earlier today, which I, I was really appreciated hearing it, every one of those ones caught is and or was an individual, a thinking, feeling being. And one of the uh, horrible side effects is so-called bycatch, unwanted, untargeted species who are typically thrown back in the ocean dead or dying. 200,000, sorry, 200 million tons a day of bycatch is thrown back into the ocean. I mentioned might makes right, which is kind of the relationship we've had with animals. If you have the power to do, lord it over them, um, it's okay to do that. And as everyone here pretty much knows, animals are almost still today universally defined at, legally as the property of humans. Here it is, might makes right. And might makes right has a pretty diverse and rich, for want of a better word, history in human behavior. Colonialism, where European countries marched into other countries and took over and just essentially decided how to rule the place is, a, is, a, is one manifestation of might makes right as is the, or was the African slave trade, the subjugation of women's rights, and the denial of civil rights. These are all historical manifestations of might makes right thinking. Fortunately, we've done a lot to relegate these past social ills to the history books. As we know from at least one session today, there's a long way to go still. There are still a lot of uh, imbalances that need to be addressed. In his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, the American psychologist Steven Pinker outlines a number of what he calls civilizing processes, which I think they certainly give me some hope that we uh, not only have made some, so, some moral progress and some cultural advances, but we can and will continue to do so. Just a few examples of these civilizing processes. The rise of statehoods, where leadership is determined not by bloodline, as monarchies say, but rather by elected people. Now, granted, we can make electoral mistakes. I won't give any examples. Um, but nevertheless, when we elect people, it's a democratic process. It's something that's closer to the will of the people than the old school ways that are going by the wayside. The rise of the empowerment of women is another great force for good. There's been mention about gender ratios today and some of the imbalances coming from that, the, the opposite imbalance is coming from that. Nevertheless, uh, the empowerment of women is a great step forward. It is scientifically shown that women are a more nurturing, compassionate gender than males, on average, of course, and that can only serve well for uh, issues of justice as we go forward. The fact that other countries are viewed now not as a source of human slaves or, or some other kind of resource that we can just take with our might makes right way of thinking, but rather as trading partners who we can mutually benefit from. The rise of literacy, remarkable increases of literacy, tens of percentiles just in the last century alone. The fact that we are interchanging information all the time, the internet is a great force for good in this regard as well. 
and the rise of reason. IQ scores have actually increased by 10, over 10%, or actually above 30% during the 20th century. You can read Pinker to look at that. I mean, I was shocked by that. Are we really smarter than we were? Perhaps not, but for whatever reason, we do better on IQ tests than we used to. So these are all forces that may be helping to lead to more social change that we've seen, and perhaps some to come. To, to wit is the fact that we have an unprecedented concern about animals. We're, we're seeing a social movement that's so vital and so important, and it's really beginning to flourish. Uh, just looking out at this room is, is symptomatic of that. And the fact is, we, uh, almost all the animals we kill are killed to be eaten. And I'm encouraged by another form of pro progress, and it's technological process. We have companies like New Wave Foods, whose headquarters in San Leandro, Leandro California, I visited earlier this year, which are producing uh, plant-based seafood, seafood that n never swam or never suffered. Um, and, you can, and they've already released uh, shrimp onto the market. It's coming into real retail next year. It's in food distribution now in some states. And then we have Finless Foods, a startup that just started uh, sort of a biotech firm, if you like, with, a, with an ethical bent. Their two founders are both vegans. And uh, they are developing the in vitro uh, seafood, so where it's actually using uh, fish or seafood cells and growing them in a clean lab and developing that as a replacement that once again doesn't require exploit exploiting animals. And then just a few, to finish with a few salutary examples of how people are helping fishes in some unusual ways. We have people who pet sharks. Uh, they dive with sharks. They wear the chain mail, not because the sharks don't like them or are going to try and bite them. It's just a good policy to do that. But Christina Zanato on the left here, she uh, strokes these sharks and she takes down gear and equipment with which she can remove fishing hooks from the sharks' mouths. The sharks get super relaxed. They go into this super relaxed state. And um, this blue shark, you can see a huge fishing hook. A lot of fishermen don't want to deal with the business end of a shark when they get them on the, to the boat side. So they just cut the line and let the animal go. And the animal ends up with this sharp thing impeding its, its normal existence. This blue shark, after having the hook removed with bolt cutters, swam around with the divers for some minutes afterwards. And we know that there's uh, anecdotal examples of whales doing this, appearing to show gratitude. And uh, we may speculate that a, a shark, which has a pretty big brain and a long-lived, sophisticated animal, uh, may also know to show, to, to feel gratitude towards somebody who helps, who helps him or her. The gentleman in this photograph on the left, um, Mike, Powell, Mike Howell, I should say, uh, taught at a uh, university in Alabama. He was an ichthyologist and he got tired of collecting fishes and putting them in pickle jars. Horrible situation to sit rotting on shells for decade after decade and then they eventually become unusable anyway. So he invented the this tank, this uh, TP tank, this teaching photographic tank where you can catch the fish in the field and then just put a little of its native water in this tank and then the, drop the fish in. The fish is temporarily somewhat immobilized. You take pictures, you can identify them, you get beautiful photographs of them. Uh, you can identify them to species usually, and then you can let them go instead of killing them. So he, recognized, he, he estimates that over a million fishes so far have been saved by this device. So, so there's many ways we can and are beginning to help fishes. And I love what Sylvia Earle said. I'll let you read it. I won't read it to you. She's sort of the uh, America's answer to Jane Goodall, only for oceans and fishes. She's a, a TED Prize winner. She's a very celebrated, now into her 80s, uh, biologist. And um, she connects the relationship we have with fishes with how we, our food choices, which is such a vital part of it, given that most of the fishes we kill, most of the harm we do to them are to be eaten. And uh, to me, that way of ethics speaks to a, um, a society where we respect animals in general as not just things, but beings, not just alive, but they have lives, not just biology but biographies. And that's the kind of society I want to live in. Thank you very much. We have, a, we have a little bit of time for questions. So I think do we have mic, we have mic stands. If people, sorry, the, the lights makes it hard to see. Can so if anyone has some questions.
I guess I solved it all. I no questions. I guess no. So. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, my question is about um, when you're at the dentist's office. Say it again. At the what? When dentist? you're at the dentist's office. Ah, this is going to be a new question. I can tell. <laughs> That's what I'm going for. Yeah. Um, and you see a fish tank, and I they know. have exotic, beautiful, colored fish. Um, when you encounter this, do you say something? If so, what do you say? And can you maybe speak to us about where those fish might be coming from and how they're captured? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and uh, it's a great opportunity for activism. Whenever you, we encounter something that may be a little off color in terms of how we're treating animals, I think we should treat it as an opportunity to, uh, to educate in a way. It's always tricky, but um, I think it's important that we say something. Um, I have to say, I, I have pretty good dentists. They usually have uh, Escher prints on the ceiling, so I can look at these strange illustrations that M.C. Escher did and figure out how do those soldiers continue marching uphill. Uh, and it's weird. So I haven't been in a, in a dentist office, at least not for a long, long time, that has fish. I was in an office that had tiny pygmy frogs in a tiny little, not even worthy of the word, tank um, some years ago. And I did say something about that. And the next time I went in, it was gone. So I was encouraged by that. Of course, I don't know what the fate of those little frogs was. But I do think it's an opportunity to say something. And I leave it to your creative minds to s come up with what might be the best approach. I think it depends on um, the particular relationship you may have with that dentist. It's a, it's a delicate situation, but I think it's important that we say something. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, great. I can't see you, but I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I can remember, we won't talk about my age, but um, I can remember back in fifth grade doing a book report and realizing at that time, after some research, that fish actually feel pain. And of course, one of the things that a lot of people had told me prior to that when I was growing up was that fish didn't feel pain, and even when they were hooked, and they clearly looked like they were in pain, that they were not. So um, more recently, we've heard about snails being able to feel pain. Um, and I guess I just wanted to get a sense of how far back some of the statistics that you have go. Um, I realize that we're still doing research and we're still figuring these things out and learning about these animals, which I really appreciate, but didn't know if most of this is recent or if it really goes back a ways and we just haven't been paying attention. Right. I I don't know how long it's been. Uh, I'm sure throughout history people have debated or wondered or speculated whether fishes feel pain or maybe they weren't even thinking about it. But uh, in, my, in my actual four-hour lectures, when I do give that length, I do include, include fish pain. I actually have a couple of slides. I, I dedicate several pages to that in the book, so I can assure you I address that. It's, uh, it's a question that it's, it's too bad that we even have to think about it or whether we're still, there's still some question about it. I'm not suggesting you question it, but uh, there are a lot of people, particularly fishermen and some scientists. Scientists have a, a brilliant way of being the last ones to cotton on to, to a, a fact or reality. It's just part of their conservatism. Um, the science is very clear. Um, there's a series of studies on trouts that were summarized in a book called Do Fish Feel Pain that was published in 2010. And the answer to that question is very clearly they do. Uh, but there's also a study of zebra fishes that I think very elegantly, if not very humanely, demonstrates pain in a fish. And, and since you asked, I'll just very briefly describe this study. It requires me putting my glass of water down. So zebra fishes are very commonly used in research. They're very cute, beautiful little stripy fishes, hence the name zebrafish. And so they used about 30 or so in this study. And what they did was they kept them in a, and this is a paradigm that's been used to demonstrate pain in chickens and other species. And they kept them in a complex tank that had two chambers. One was a desirable chamber, dimly lit with places to hide, vegetation and rocks and that sort of thing. And then it communicated with another chamber, which was an undesirable chamber that was brightly lit and barren. And little fishes who have enemies and want to feel safe don't like to be swimming in brightly lit barren places. So they spent pretty much all of their time in chamber number one. It was uh, the enriched chamber, if you like. And then they divided them into two groups and they injected them either with the experimental, which was a, an acid, presumably caustic and probably painful if they can feel pain, stimulus. The other group received a saline injection. So they got the prick, the pin prick, without the lasting pain, assuming they feel pain. And the, all the fishes continued to swim around in the enriched tank. And then they dissolved a painkiller, lidocaine, in the 
undesirable side of the tank. And lo and behold, some of the little zebrafish started swimming across and hanging out in this now uh, anesthet or, or this pain relieving area of the tank. And it was only the ones who'd received the acid injection. The ones who received the saline, who presumably were not feeling any lasting discomfort, remained in the safe, happy tank. They didn't have the need for pain relief, but the ones with the acid, they realized they could get relief from swimming over there. So that shows three things. A fish can feel pain, they have the wherewithal to relieve it, and they're even willing to pay a cost to relieve that pain. I think that's a pretty clear demonstration in one particular species of fish, which I think is pretty representative of certainly bony fishes, that they do in fact feel pain. So thanks for indulging me while I describe that particular study. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yes. Hi. Um, so recently we have gotten a lot of statistical information about how the oceans are going to be be depleted soon, and I was just wondering um, to what extent do you feel that, that those statistics are accurate? I just want to make sure I heard the key part of your thing. The oceans are going to be what? Depleted. Depleted, right. Yeah, yeah good word. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a very much a doomsday kind of scenario. Um, and, and I have to say, on one level, I think uh, it's, a, it's a ridiculous claim because we're so dependent on oceans. There's another slide I didn't use tonight that um, the word oxygen. Uh, more than half of all oxygen that we all depend on, all life depends on pretty much, on Earth at least, is produced by blue-green algae in the oceans. So where the oceans go, we go. I mean, uh, and fishes, one could argue that they're not critical to that, but really, if you think about it, with the incredible diversity and in numbers that they have in the ocean, they, they are absolutely a critical part of a healthy, functioning ocean ecosystem. Not to mention freshwater, which is another huge part of Earth's uh, ecosystems. So we would be breathing our last breath and disappearing long before the fishes all disappeared. So we really, it's not, it's not a tenable outcome that we would eliminate them all. Which is to say all the more so that we need to be mindful of our behavior and we need to be not rapacious and we need to be not make, might makes right and be restrained in our relationship to, to life on this planet. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, there is a movement in the vegan community that I've seen from some fairly well-known vegan dietitians and some others that are in some ways suggesting that vegans eat oysters and muscles because they don't feel pain. And um, so I'm curious as to your findings and your research and what your position is on that. Yeah, that's a great question. I've, I've heard about that. Um, personally, I just, whether, whether an animal's sentient or not, I, I, I like the precautionary principle. I like to give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, oysters and mussels are mollusks. They're in the same phylum as octopuses and squids, for which there's very rigorous evidence now, uh, not only of sentience, but personality and emotions and this sort of thing. So that alone gives me a little bit of pause about eating one of their cousins. Um, the fact is, uh, you know, having been a vegan myself for over 25 years, I love the food I eat. It's very satisfying to me. Uh, I don't feel the need to expand my, my dietary reach into areas where animals are found. So uh, personally, I don't, I don't feel the need to make that argument. And maybe one day science will show that these sessile um, mollusks are actually not sentient. I doubt it's going to happen. Sentience is uh, in a sort of, an, in a way, an impenetrable scientific problem because it, feelings are absolutely private. You can't feel the feeling of another being, um, particularly another species. We, we at least can verbally report how we're feeling and we generally accept that. Someone could be lying or someone could be a robot from outer space, but we generally don't accept that as a scenario that's realistic. So um, I think, and I, that definitely science can help us to have a, a good hunch or a good idea whether an animal can feel scent, can feel pain or not, vis-a-vis the, -vis the, the zebrafish study I just described. So I don't know what science is going to show with um, oysters and clams. We, we have this journal now, Animal Sentience, and maybe someone's going to submit something. But now that, given that scientists are now making the case that insects may be conscious, we published a paper on that in our journal last year, and they may be sentient, and they're in the same phylum arthropods that crabs and decapod crustaceans and lobsters are in, and there's some very good scientific evidence that they can feel pain and experience pain, uh, all the more reason that we should be very cautious about, about making uh, assumptions of non-pain in something like a, a mollusk. Good evening. My name is Rebecca Bretter from Vancouver, Hi. Canada. Um, thank you so much for this talk. Absolutely brilliant and, and 
so touching in so many ways. I'm curious in your experience and doing the research that you've done, have you received any backlash within your scientific community and, and from colleagues? And if so, how did you deal with it? Minimal, uh, minimal backlash, uh, which may be a bad sign. Maybe they don't just give a damn what I'm saying. Uh, you know, you, you almost want some criticism because at least it means they're reading what you've written. Uh, lots of praise, lots of positive response, um, including from some corners of science. Uh, but generally, the scientific establishment has been fairly neutral and agnostic about, about what I've done. And, Really, I'm celebrating science by this work because uh, I'm not actually doing the original research except when I go snorkeling, which is not going to be published in a scientific journal. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a synthesizer. I take the, the great science that scientists have done with their creative minds and, and innovative approaches, and I'm really celebrating the work of scientists. So I do hope that some scientists are at least pleased with the fact that I'm doing that, whether or not I make the extra step and make, start making moral and social conclusions, that's when they may get a little uncomfortable. Uh, but that's, that's my mission. I, I want to change our relationship to them. So science is critical to doing that. Well, that's very good to hear. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yes. Hi. Um, so Hi. I found it interesting how you explained that in areas where there's spear fishing, the fish become very intimidated and they don't want to come near humans. So what would you propose that we do in situations where some call for a need to actually spear fish animals in cases where there's invasive species like the lionfish in the Caribbean? Do you propose that we call them um, from an ethical perspective? How do we navigate that sort of situation? Yeah, great question, a really thorny one. Um, yeah, just to, just to back up a little bit on the study, uh, the, the one study that I cite in my book is a study in which they actually did spearfish some fishes in, in different areas, and they found that in areas where they shot them with spears, um, those fishes had a much greater escape distance, so fleeing distance. Um, so you, had, you could be twice as far away and they'd start swimming away from you than in areas where they didn't persecute them. And that's the kind of approach they took in that study. And there's also been, I think, a few studies where they didn't spearfish them, they just simply compared those distances in areas where they were persecuted and in protected sanctuaries where they were not. Um, as for difficult quandaries such as introduced lionfishes, of course, we're the ones who brought them there in the wrong place. Um, and they are causing some, apparently, from what I read, some really serious disruptions of local fish populations because they're poisonous and they're predatory and they're apparently flourishing in areas. Now, nature does in time generally correct the imbalance. It just may take a while and there can be problems in the meantime. The fact is we have put them there. Um, regardless of that, um, I think it's safe to say that if it's, a, I, I believe if the animal is sentient, and it's pretty clear that a lionfish is a sentient creature, then we need to be mindful and careful about what methods we may use. I don't regard uh, piercing an animal kind of randomly through the body as a particularly humane way of, of killing the animal or removing the animal. So I think we have a responsibility to reflect on that and come up with uh, better techniques um, or else maybe we need to leave be. I mean, uh, you know, it's a difficult question, but uh, certainly I'm not happy with uh, spearing as a method. Yeah. Okay, I think maybe we're done. If anyone uh, is interested in a book signed, I will be just behind this room in the next adjoining space. So thanks again for hearing me.